Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at problem solving and what can be done to bring conflicting points of view together to resolve problems peacefully and to collaborate together on a future, really a future agreement that will be harmonious to all sides. My guest is an expert in this area. Mr. Stuart Levine is a creative problem solver, widely recognized for creating agreement and empowerment in the most challenging circumstances. Mr. Levine has an innovative work called Agreements for Results, and he describes himself as a resolutionary. Stuart Levine, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. You, you, you caught me, you captured my imagination with all your, your biography and everything leading up to this, but let's start off. What is a resolutionary? That, <laughs> we've heard of revolutionaries, but what's a resolutionary? Sure. Uh, well, the way I would describe it is, is a resolutionary is someone who is committed to resolving uh, conflict or differences in a very, very peaceful way. And I've had that on my business card since about 1990 or 91. And, and how it emerged is I was coaching a client through a difficult situation of conflict. And at the end of it, he looked at me and he said, Stuart, you are a resolutionary. And uh, that struck a chord. And one of the proudest things of, I, I love the term, is that I never had to pay a branding or marketing expert a whole lot of money to come up with the term, but it, it describes it. And it's kind of, yeah, there's a little bit of that cross between resolutionary and revolutionary because I, I started my working career as a practicing attorney. And I had a sense that a lot of the systems uh, and a lot of parts of the legal system don't really work effectively to solve problems. So um, I was always kind of looking for good creative ways to solve problems. And that's been a driving force in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Now you have a website, resolutionworks.com. And if our viewers go to that, what will they find on that website? Well, right now they'll find uh, lots of information about me, about some of the programs I do, about clients and situations I've worked with over time. There'll be some videos, there'll be a bunch of articles, um, there'll be links to the books that I've written, and very, very soon, I'll be launching a brand new website with a, a learning course that people could take that I like to call a master course in resolving conflict. Mm -hmm. Which is very important since we all are involved in some type of conflict. Be a, it could be in a family, it could be in a community, it could be internationally, it, we just don't know where, it, where it's going to end, but uh, conflict is inevitable. The question is, how do we deal with it? Now, you wrote the book Agreements for Results. What uh, what was what were some of the highlights of that particular publication? Sure. And the, the 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 formal title of the book it's actually called the Book of Agreement. Okay, the Book of Agreement. I decided to give it a little bit of a biblical flavor, but but in it um, are agreements for results. And, and here's what I want to say about that. All right. <clears throat> um, when we collaborate with other people, um, we do it by working together and we do it in a way that is either guided by um, explicit or implicit agreements. You know, we have lots of agreements. We have agreements with the people we live with, the, with the vendors we hire, and so much of it is implicit. And what I say is when you have implicit agreements, there's a lot that's left to the imagination. And I say that we could, we could prevent a whole lot of conflict if we made our agreements more explicit. And so I have 10 elements that go into creating an agreement for results. And it's about creating a shared vision for where you wanna to get to and how you're gonna get there and who's gonna do what to get you there. So it's a little different than, than legal agreements, which are all about what I call agreements for protection. It's the opposite. It's what if this goes wrong and what if that goes wrong. Agreements for results really are about collaboration and working together towards a shared vision. And the interesting phenomenon is that most people don't think about it. If you have conflict and you resolve it, including going before a judge and having a court decide 
all you get is a new agreement. And so it's an interesting phenomenon. You could cut short that whole process by just saying, this isn't working. Why don't we just create a new agreement that'll get us to where we want to go? You've done some consulting work, or you've done consulting work for a wide range of companies, such as Chevron, General Motors, very diverse companies, some that are similar, some that are very dissimilar. Did you find that there are certain commonalities when you're doing this consulting work with these different companies that they all have some similar problems, yet some dissimilar problems? Yeah. Challenges, <laughs> maybe I should say challenges. Yes. And it, it, all, it all boils down to, Bill, individuals who are committed to being right, okay? And as soon as someone thinks that they are right and it's their way or the highway, you're going to end up in a, in a piece of conflict. And that's, that's the ego piece that steps in. And um, in, in my experience, the bigger, more effective leaders are people who know how to work together with others and recognize that they may have one piece of the solution, but they don't have the entire picture and the entire solution. And you know, whether it's in large organizations, whether it's in government, small organizations, that's the commonality that I find. It's all about helping to shift and reframe the way people are seeing things, you know? Some of the way people see, see things in terms of right or wrong uh, all come from worldview and some of the ways that they were conditioned almost at a pre-conscious level as kids to see the world a certain way. And the critical piece is to get people beyond that so that they, they can have more clear seeing about a broader picture of what they're trying to um, accomplish and what needs to get resolved on the way to that. Mm -hmm. Now, you're participating in Rick Smyers' Communities of the Future that Don't Exist Yet project. What types of ideas will you bring to that? How do, how do you bring your thinking or your, uh, your skills, your techniques, your tips, so to speak, to this discussion so that an entire community, I guess an entire community, would look at this and say, this is how we can work our way through some of these challenges uh, what, what types of uh, input do you, do you expect to have on that? Sure. So the, 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 the biggest arena, I think, is that, you know, um, currently lots of conflict um, is handled in, a, in the legal system in what we, we call the adversary modality. I mean, we just saw some example of it, you know, not a great one uh, in the impeachment trial last week, right? Um, but it's two sides kind of banging heads together. And if you think about the origin of that, you know, the king's court, they used to have jousting <laughs> to decide who was right and who was wrong and someone could end up without their head, all right? Well, we live in a world where the problems are so big at this point in time that um, that's not gonna work going forward, all right? And essentially, as opposed to thinking of it as a court case, think of it as a problem that needs to be solved. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. The first book I wrote was called uh, um, Getting to Resolution, Turning Conflict into Collaboration. And one of the prime endorsers of that book was uh, Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And when he wrote an endorsement for the book, he actually said, this is a beautiful way of solving problems. Okay, now we all know we live in a world with problems and, and the problems that we have are very, very big, all right? We've got global warming. We've got um, income inequality. We've got developing nations. We've got hunger. And my thinking has always been, there's more than enough here for everyone. We don't have a, dis we don't have a resource challenge. We have a distribution challenge. And so part of what I wanna bring to, to Rick's communities of the future is how can we act from a place of connectivism, okay? And, and how can we uh, enable um, hearing what other people have to say about a problem and how can we design the solutions that take into account everybody's both particular problem but also everybody's piece of the solution. So I can bring what I call resolutionary thinking, 
I can bring agreements for results, and I can bring what I call the cycle of resolution, which is a way of moving through differences and conflict in a peaceful, effective way. And that's the way we need to do it. There's no doubt about it. Or you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or perhaps you're involved with a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our show and you'd like to share the, the shows with other people, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at the resolution of differences in a peaceful way. And my guest is an expert in this area. Mr. Stuart Levine is a creative problem solver, solver widely recognized for creating agreement and empowerment in the most challenging circumstances. He defines himself as a resolutionary. Stuart, we're talking about communities. Let's take this out to a larger level. I'm glad you mentioned income inequality and that type of thing, because these are major issues. Climate change is often viewed by many of the experts as our number one challenge in the world. How do you see us, if we could just take that as an example, we have, uh, there's so much scientific evidence now that's just overwhelming, that climate change is taking place humans have caused a vast majority of it. We, we think that we're leaving our carbon footprint we have for decades and centuries really. But how can, how can we take that climate change issue and bring your techniques into it to help people resolve this problem because it's a major problem. And of course you see, I know you've been involved with some of the fossil fuel companies in the past probably and probably clean energy companies. And there's a sharp debate on both sides there, but how can, how can we have, have that, if we need, which I think we do, the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy and to rethinking how we refurbish our cities, our cars, just on across the board? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, last night on 60 Minutes, Bill Gates was one of the guests, and um, that's where his focus is at this point in time. So I, I was kind of stimulated a bit by by his conversation in terms of, you know, the kinds of technological advances um, that are gonna be necessary if we can get over this. Now, having said that, all right, a little bit of background. In 2005, I volunteered and uh, learned about climate science from the source itself, from Al Gore. I actually flew to uh, uh, Nashville and was trained uh, by the vice president himself in the climate science presentations that he did for his movie, An Inconvenient Truth. So, um, and I had read his first book before that, which kind of interested me about the challenges that we were facing. And that goes back to the, to, the, uh, to the mid 90s. Now, having said that, we know what the solution would look like in terms of not creating any more uh, greenhouse gases and, and, and stopping the current impact that that human activity is having on climate, which has got all kinds of tentacles, you know, the, the food sources, the changes in temperatures, the, the climate changes, the changes in, you know, in the in the in in chemistry on the earth. Anyway, you need to start with the big vision of where we need to go. It's how I how I resolve conflict. Let's start off with so if this situation were all resolved, what would the vision look like? And if you always chunk up big enough, you can get everybody to say, yeah, that would be a great vision. I can live with that. Great. And then I say, good. So let's see if we can't create an agreement for how it is that we're going to get there. All right. Um, and it involves letting go of some individual drivers uh, like, you know, profitability for the fo fossil fuel companies, but they're already kind of moving in that direction. And if you listen to the latest coming out of the automobile companies, I think GM is committed not to, not to use any more fossil fuel automobiles after uh, 2035, which is not that far 
into the future. But you need to get all of the players around the same table, you know, talking about this and having clarity and having agreement. Um, one of the uh, um, key pieces is that uh, climate change has a, has a, a disproportionate amount, a, an impact on um, uh, indigenous people, people of color, poor people, because of its impact on the local food supplies. So, you know, we're dealing with um, something that has many prongs to it. You need all the players around the table because if, if the solution is dictated to someone, people are not gonna go along with it. The whole notion of um, getting buy-in from a lot of the um, company, uh, countries around the world that are aspiring, aspiring to have a, um, a first world country lifestyle um, will just contribute to making things worse. And that's where we need all kinds of technological innovation that will enable people to have the quote goodies, but not have the impact on the climate. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. We cannot combat climate change individually. It has to be a group effort. We have to bring basically every country in the world to the table. And that's been the role of the United Nations since really back in 1972, but more recently since 1992 through a series of conferences, international conferences, through the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC that they set up in 1988, through the Paris Climate Accord, which the United States is now re-entering. We should never have gotten out of it. It was a drastic mistake doing that, in my opinion. But th this is a role for the United Nations. But the UN is not a one world government. It, it only it has very limited powers. It has the power of persuasion, primarily. And you have 193 countries that are member states at the UN. Is there something the UN uh, can do to maybe accelerate this process? Because we were losing, it seems we're losing the battle on climate change right now, as some of the experts are saying. I hate to say this, uh, but it may have to get worse before it gets better. And, you know, to this date, people have not really felt the, 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 the core impact, I think, in some ways of uh, climate change. Uh, and people in first world countries haven't felt the real um, key impact of, of international terrorism. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a thesis, uh, a frame in the world of conflict resolution that um, people aren't ready to resolve things until they feel enough pain. And, and, you know, come back when there's more pain and then people will be more inclined and conditioned to want to resolve it. So I'm not sure exactly where we are on that continuum yet. Everyone with intelligence and foresight is pointing to what is going to happen unless we take action now. Um, an example, you know, for something the UN could do is more teeth that all of the sovereign nations agree to in terms of adhering to certain principles and a certain pathway with certain um, penalties involved. Uh, that's that to me is the best way, but also the other side, the flip side, is a positive vision for something that they can work toward. Um, but I don't know if we have reached that point yet of um, severe pain that people will just go, okay, I give up. It's time for me to get off the horse I've been riding and get on to a different horse because of where we are. Um, this horse is beaten to death. You're absolutely right. So often it has to, we have to hit the bottom before we can come back. And of course, uh, with climate change, it, it's, it's like a slow moving car wreck, it, except now it's accelerating. We see the ice is melting faster in the Arctic and Antarctic. We see the oceans are becoming uh, desalinated more quickly or salinated more quickly, I guess. Uh, we see that uh, there's a chance that parts of Florida within 15 years will be underwater. Bangladesh, 20% of the country will be underwater within 15, 20, 30 years, something like that. So, and of course, at that point, then we have to say, whoops, it's too late. 
<laughs> we well, have to I, reverse. <laughs> yeah, Al, Al Gore used to say, and a lot of people remember this, you know, um, denial is not just a river in Egypt. Uh, <laughs> right. And it really is, it really is true. And he used to talk a lot about having um, political will. And that's what we haven't yet. I mean, we've just come out of four years of a climate, essentially a climate denier um, leading the United States. And, uh, you know, it's easier in some ways to be in denial. And then all of a sudden um, you're underwater completely. Um, so, you know, I just say to everyone out there who's listening, uh, it's time to be real in terms of listening to scientists and in terms of taking action. Now, what I want to say about that uh, also, Bill, is that it's a huge economic opportunity, huge economic opportunity. People keep talking about this in terms of, you know, uh, potential for green industries. And I think it is, you know, absolutely true and absolutely real. If we start to retool in many different ways, um, we would have both uh, economic uh, expansion and also uh, solve the challenges of climate change and global warming. Mm -hmm. And of course, through that, uh, through that economic investment and expansion is the creation of jobs. And if people, for example, coal miners lose their jobs, which they're doing, the market is putting coal out of business. It's not primarily governmental policies. It's really the free market that's doing it. And of course, when these coal miners lose their jobs, we need to have retraining. We need to have alternative economic activities that go into East Kentucky or West Virginia or wherever it might be to help the miners have economic viability and to, and to have an income. So there, it's certainly something that we need to move towards. Well, before we run out of time, Stuart, let me just ask you in closing, what do you see as our biggest challenge as we move forward uh, we, we could spend a week on climate change, another week on income inequality, but what do you see as we move forward in general to try to resolve these problems and resolve them peacefully so that we can collaborate together on a, an agreed upon solution that's a win-win for everybody? Sure. I mean, just uh, very, very quickly, Colin Powell knew the way to cure terrorism was to move people out of resignation and get them into a place of um, thinking about a potential vision that they would have. As I said earlier, we don't have a, a, a resource challenge on planet Earth. We have a distribution challenge. And I think the biggest thing is um, conquering inner space. I said this earlier, but the mindsets that people have, mindsets that maybe worked in the 18th, 19th, 20th century about being adversarial as a way to resolve conflict, no longer work. We have uh, the threat of climate change. We have nuclear disaster. We've got to learn as a species how to um, handle uh, these challenges. And we're only gonna get to the other side by working um, together through a sense of connectivism and through a sense of allowing uh, solutions to emerge. And that often involves a complete change and a shift of mindset so we're going through a, a process and I think a time of great re-education. We certainly are. But Stuart Levine, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure to be here. Good to see you. Thank you. You too. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.